Hello people, Zach here again today, and uh, today um, it's going to be another rant. As you can see, I'm in uh, the darkness right now. Um, this is not going to be anything in line with um, my normal niche, which is on um, philosophy. Um, this is uh, going to be about object-oriented programming, why it is fucking garbage and needs to die. Um, it has no redeeming qualities whatsoever. I will get into it. Please watch the entire video before commenting something stupid below or hitting the dislike button. Uh, that's all I can ask. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, first thing is to define object-oriented programming uh, because there are two different... I mean, it, the, the definition of it varies from person to person, but there's also two things that are called object-oriented programming, which are so completely and radically different from each other, um, and yet some people will try to use one of them to justify the existence of the other. Um, first things first, uh, object-oriented programming was originally invented to deal with systems that were based off of simulations. Um, and so what they were trying to do is they were trying to figure out how to design a uh, somewhat fault-tolerant uh, distributed uh, computation network. So if you imagine uh, you have all of these, what you they would call them, I would expect them, but they're really more like processes um, that are running on machines that don't share memory at any way at all. And the only way that they any data gets passed around is by sharing a mutable state. And uh, there's some benefits to this. The first thing is that if one of your objects becomes corrupt, and it crashes or something, it doesn't take out everything else. Um, and so you can also have objects that have, um, that can observe other objects. So you can have one object that observes uh, two other objects, and so if one of those objects dies, and it sends message to it, and it sends another message to it, and it's not getting any responses back, it can say, okay, well this object's clearly dead, let me try and resurrect it. So it um, sends a kill message to it to guarantee that it's dead, reboots it back up, and so now like, it's a, you have like a self-repairing network. If anything gets destroyed, it can fix itself. And this is perfect if you're dealing through something like if you have a mobile network switching um, system, or if you're uh, dealing with like a, an investing or uh, an accounting system where you have multiple servers that have to act up as backup nodes because uh, killing your entire server for like even 10 minutes is something that could lose billions of dollars. And this is, take for example, I'm, I use uh, Coinbase to uh, do some of my crypto investing and uh, they recently updated their servers and so they were offline for 10 minutes. And when they did that, they destroyed the entire crypto market instantaneously. And I sent them a nasty game. I... I took like 20, 30 minutes of my time just trying to find the customer support so I could tell them that not to ever do that again. Um, that was the dumbest thing I've ever seen. Like, if I was in charge of that team, every last one of those people who were on that team would have been fired. Um, that should have been super obvious that is not something you can do. But, um, so as I can say, like, the original uh, object-oriented programming was actually more associated with something that's now known today is actor-oriented um, programming. So now to um, to talk about the way that we actually do object-oriented programming now, um, which is uh, uses class definitions, and uh, it, it's based off of certain principles. Um, who you ask, you're going to get different answers. But the usual things that you hear about are going to be uh, encapsulation, data hiding, uh, polymorphism, and inheritance. Uh, these are um, four terms you hear thrown around all the time. Uh, first things first, um, talking about polymorphism, um, really the only way that object-oriented programming uh, does polymorphism is through inheritance hierarchies, strictly speaking. Uh, in most modern programming languages made over the 12, last few years, this is no longer the case. Um, and the reason why is because they realize that inheritance is garbage. Uh, anyone who hasn't been living under a rock has figured this out. It creates very, very rigid hierarchies that are difficult to change. Um, and you also end up with very, very deep nesting. Um, it's, it makes the problem harder to understand and not easier because the, the more, there's more information that you have to know. Like You can't just look at one file and know uh, what all of that object's state is and what all of the things that it can do because it's actually scattered among like 10, 15, 100 different other files um, based off of what's inheriting what. 
Uh, and the first thing we realized in trying to and do that is that multiple inheritance was a bad idea. And that just kind of expanded. We realized more and more, okay, what we really should be doing is things like interfaces or traits or mix-ins. And, and the people who are not familiar with uh, what these things are, uh, an interface and a trait are, um, are, are sort of uh, similar in a sense. Um, with, with interfaces, what we're actually saying is like, okay, here's a set of behaviors that I expect. Uh, and then the class has to explicitly implement that. And, and a trait is a, a sort of the same way, but the thing with a trait is that rather than inherit, uh, defining the behavior inside of the type definition, you can attach the, the trait onto something else that already exists. And so what this means is that you don't pigeonhole yourself into a, a strict type hierarchy. And this is one of the benefits that uh, some modern languages like Rust have. Traits are a very excellent idea, but they're not object-oriented. They're not based off of inheritance. Um, interfaces and traits uh, and mixins are all technically not object-oriented. Uh, they exist to uh, band-aid the problems that are caused by object-oriented programming to undo the damage that we are doing to ourselves. Uh, and mixins, uh, just to clarify what those are, mixin is kind of like an abstract class that doesn't inherit from any other class. So it guarantees that you have these uh, shallow type hierarchies. And uh, with a mixin, you don't uh, inherit a mix-in like you would a class. What you do is you include it inside of something. And so the idea is that you have this compositional inheritance uh, that you can, uh, that rather than, um, I mean, this compositional type construction rather than inheritance. Uh, and so th there's an idiom that's been uh, that's, uh, occurred over recent years because we've realized about all the problems that come with inheritance is that uh, you should always prefer composition over inheritance because inheritance causes more problems than itself. So one of the three main things uh, involved with object-oriented programming, we have all pretty much come into an agreement that this is just a really bad idea uh, in practice. We have tons and tons of um, empirical data to support this claim. Uh, the second thing has to do with... Um, Polymorphism. Uh, like I said, polymorphism, the only way that it's really supported in object oriented programming, um, excluding the things that I've mentioned before with traits and interfaces and mix ins, is through inheritance. Um, there are much better ways of doing polymorphism that don't involve that. Uh, you have like structural typing, there's duct typing, um, there's um, there's generics, both uh, explicit like parametric generics and pattern matching, which is more like implicit generics through uh, type inference. Um, and uh, there's also like a function type signature overloading, which is like one of the few things that C++ um, does that's actually beneficial. Um, majority of the stuff that they do is just kind of bull crap. Uh, but anyway, um, so like I said, there's many different ways in which you can do polymorphism. Um, Oh yeah, and uh, fun partial function evaluation slash uh, currying is another thing that's uh, fits in that niche default function arguments. But like I said, there are so many things that are involved with polymorphism that you can do uh, that are way more powerful than what object-oriented programming affords you. Um, and to say that it's, it's helpful at all is, I, I think, kind of deceiving yourself. And uh, so the third thing is encapsulation slash uh, data hiding. Um, now, first things first, when we were talking about access modifiers like public, private, and protected, the real reason why these things exist is to prevent conflicts when you're dealing with inheritance hierarchies. Um, if you have something that's private, then that means that any class that inherits um, the class that you've defined won't inherit that particular member. It's not visible to it. And so you prevent a conflict. And if it's public, it's exposed to it, obviously. And uh, when they were trying to restrict um, access from external to the object, like you didn't want other code to mess with your object state, that's where they made the distinction between like public and protected, which protected meant that it could be shared with any um, derived class, but uh, not with anything that was outside of the object. And see, this is where I think we're already starting to run into problems because um, you are not making problems easier to solve by restricting what you have access to. That's ridiculous. Um, and that should be obvious. Um, Python actually took an interesting approach with this um, when they made their language, which is that if you placed an underscore in front of a uh, an identifier, it meant that it was not visible, but it didn't mean that you couldn't access it. You could still access it. It was just kind of like um, a hint that you 
um, should be careful when you're messing with it that it's not guaranteed to be part of the uh, part of the, the the structure of the object which I, I don't even think really you would have to signify that because the second that you change it it's going to break any existing code anyways um, but anyways just that that's kind of going off on a tangent and so a lot of people uh, saying well you know I, I've always worked with object oriented programming and it's uh, it works for me. It's beneficial or whatever. It's like, okay, well, here, let me tell you something about object-oriented programming um, that you might be familiar with. Is uh, there, Object-oriented programming only scales in two ways. The first way is you have your rock star programmer who's able to write a, an entire um, 20, 30, 40 class uh, project by themselves on a, on a caffeine-fueled binge over the course of a week or a month or something like that. Um, but they never touch it again after that and it becomes dead in the water um, because no one can understand the monolith that they've created. Uh, and the second is that you have these projects that are so large that they can take hours to compile and it requires hundreds and hundreds of developers just to maintain them. Uh, and the reason why is because they don't make the problem simpler. You don't make a problem simpler by creating more parts and more connections between the parts. And that should be obvious. Increasing the complexity of the system, uh, every time you add a component to a system, there you have the maximum number of connections that there can be is like something like two, uh, two to the n number of connections between that uh, one object and everything else. Now, obviously, it doesn't scale like that. That's that's the worst case scenario. But it's simply the point that every time you're adding more components to the system, um, you're not just concerned with what the object is doing, but how it's being used by everything else. And object-oriented programming teaches you to fragment your programs like this. Uh, so you end up having to not only understand what the program is doing, but also what all of the components do and how all of the components are relating to each other and the mental model that is inside the head of the person who's designing the system. Uh, and the thing is that these mental models, these analogies that we try to make ourselves, don't usually fit the problem. Not every problem is as simple as uh, cat goes meow, uh, inherits uh, mammal, inherits animal. That most problems in the real world are not that simple. Um, like if I were to ask you to write a program that sorts um, letters into letter boxes, um, or uh, or to mail uh, like a like a mail routing system. If I asked you to have a mail routing system, how would you design a mail routing system? All right, does a does a letter send itself? Does a letter receive itself? Do you have a sender object or a receiver object? Is there some transmitter slash router thing that routes the packages from one end to the other? See, as you can see, there's when you try to define things as objects as doers, like you try to separate into what things do or certain responsibilities, these it's very unclear about how you design the system and who, depending on who is designing the system, it can be very different in, in every, in many ways. And so you, it's trying to understand an object oriented programming is program. Isn't as simple as just reading the actual steps that it takes. You have to get inside the head of the person who thinks differently than you. So it makes problems harder and people don't realize that. I mean, like they keep hearing how it's, it's somehow making their lives easier. And it's not, it's really not. I mean, we used to, well, back in the days when people were writing like things like Fortran or even assembly programming languages, like um, you would have teams of you know I don't know two, three, five people uh, working together, and they would create software that's almost com feature par uh, has a complete feature parity with stuff that we use today. You're talking about stuff like word processors, you know, video editors, whatever it is, um, and it was very small software as well. Um, today. You have a simple notification engine, you know, like something like Twitter or something that should be simple that one person should be able to throw together in an afternoon um, that now you can't do because, like, one, you have so many different layers of abstraction between you and the hardware that it's not even obvious how um, you have to approach the problem anymore. You have to do tons of research to figure out what you can use, what tools are in your, your tool belt that you have access to, but something that's simple like this that one person should be able to do now takes like 300 or like a thousand people to manage why and, and it's because the, the problem has been complicated to a scale where it's just it just doesn't make sense anymore uh, now the idea of uh, encapsulation is not necessarily in, in, while it is a bad idea this idea of data hiding of hiding information um, from people so that they can't access the things that they need to access to solve the damn problem. Um, well, that is a bad idea. 
And while fragmenting our prog programs into these small units, like these small individual objects that have managed responsibilities, while that is a terrible idea, the that is not an argument against the principle that our code should be modular. But the thing is that our modules should be organized based on behavior that's being similar and not based off of um, some mental fucking dumb abstraction in someone's head. Uh, there should be like, instead of having um, a box renderer inheriting from a renderer, inheriting from some graphics um, command uh, emitter inherit fucking whatever this tree is that you've constructed, um, you should just have like a graphics module with a function that says draw box. You know, why, why do you have to make it so fucking hard? And uh, one of the things that people will say as well, they'll say, okay, um, well, object-oriented programming is perfect for these um, these graphics APIs. You know, like where um, you have to create these windows and you, know, you add these buttons to the windows because like everything in a GUI is actually an object and uh, blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, no, no, actually you're wrong. Um, gra graphics, if you're talking about GUIs and stuff, they do not actually fit that well into the whole idea of widgets and stuff, um, especially if you start having objects that don't um, fit the box model shape of things. Um, if you're talking about a proceed in the performance wise, it's terrible as well. Um, but I'll, I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, when you're designing a, a, a graphical system, there's really only four different phases that a, uh, it has to go through in order to design, a, uh, in order to render the system, first of all, you have to update or animate things. Um, so, like you increase the tick step or whatever, and uh, update the transformations. Uh, the second part is um, sizing. You have to measure what the size of everything is because if the size of the viewport changes, the size of the components inside of the viewport changes, and so the sub elements of those also have to change. Um, the third step is a layout. This is where you, after you've calculated what the size of everything is, you have to calculate where to position it. Um, because if you want to center something, you have to know what size it is so that you can center it, right? Uh, and then the last step is actual uh, rendering. So these are the, the four things you actually have to do. You have to update, you have to size, you have to layout, and then you have to draw. Those are in, like, even modern graphic systems. Like, if you talk about the Android... Um, the way that it does its graphics, it does it this way. Because this is the most intuitive and the most performance effective way of doing of solving the issue. Uh, and of course you would also want to have things like hit testing. Um, but that, that's on a tangent from, because right now I'm just talking about the graphics aspects of it. But anyway, um, and, and another problem with this as well is that when you're dealing with um, large amounts of information, like if you're drawing an API, I mean a, a GUI or whatever, where you had particle simulations or stuff happening, like if you were, uh, say for example, you were writing, a, oh, I don't know, like a media player uh, where you're playing music and it has like those uh, simulations, like the fluid simulations that occur while the music is playing and you have to simulate all these particles, trying to grind through... Um, a system, I mean, a particle system in an object-oriented ray is literally like the dumbest thing you could do. Um, because one of the biggest problems with object-oriented programming is that computers fucking hate it. Object-oriented programming um, causes memory, loss of memory locality for one, um, because it tends to allocate everything on the heap individually. So you might have like one object or two, maybe even like 10 objects allocated over here on the heap, but then it decides it's going to allocate the other 10 objects over here. So you're invalidating your cache for one. Uh, and for two, it doesn't make effective use of the cache uh, because objects are a, a, an array of structured data format. Uh, so if you're going through a particle simulation and you know you have to grind through all of the transformation, like all the positions of the particles in order to update their positions, but each individual particle has like a position, a rotation, a, an image, uh, a size, a lifetime state, like all these different types of state that could be packed inside this one object, like 99% of the information that's inside of each individual particle you're not even looking at is just wasted cache space. Um, so if you were trying to create an actual... Um, an, an actual performance um, effective system, you would not design it in this way. Uh, what you would actually do is you might have like um, you, would, you would have arrays of, of particular structures. You would have uh, an array of positions and an array of rotations or, I mean, or maybe just like an array of transformations and then like an array of, uh, of sprites or whatever. Whatever you're 
designing a system for. Like, this is just a hypothetical system. I'm not getting too much in the specifics here. Um, what this means is that you're packing more useful data into your cache lines, and so you're not invalidating your cache. And most people says, well, well, that problem makes the problem harder, and um, and so uh, I, I don't want to do that. I mean, why would I want to do that and make my problem? I mean, like, if it's fast enough or whatever, um, do you not realize, like, how slow, like, the different levels of, of the cache are in, in comparison to, like, your RAM or your hard disk? Um, if you talk about, like, L0 cache, like, the register, um, L0 cache is pretty much as fast as a, as a single computer cycle. Um, but it the speed decreases exponentially. Um as you go through the different lower levels of the cache and down to the RAM and the hard disk, like I don't even know how to explain how how different the the difference in speed is because it's is it's orders of magnitude that humans just can't intuitively understand. Um, it'd be like me walking from here. Um, all the way down to the Dollar General versus taking a rocket that, you know, like Mach 10 versus 2 miles an hour. But anyway, um, so the minimum locality is one issue, and uh, the second part is that all of the object's behaviors, like the, the way that they're done, they're you know, always intended to work on a single individual object. Uh, but the thing is, is that while this does happen in some cases, like if you're dealing with like file handles, you, you might want to only work on one object at a time. Um, but there's a lot of instances in which case you want to work on a whole bunch of objects. And so you want to do batching. And then the way that you would do that in object-oriented programming is that you would tend to create some object that would be like a, it's a manager or a processor that goes over the top of it. Uh, and it pokes into the state of the individual objects, which has to be made public in order for this to work. And so now what you've done is you, it's an anti-pattern. Like you had to do the exact opposite of what is considered to be good practice in object-oriented programming in order to get decent performance. So, yeah. Uh, so we've, we've tackled the part that doesn't make programs easier to manage. In fact, it makes it more difficult. You tackle the problem that it destroys the performance of the, of the program because computers cannot stand it. Like another thing as well, vectorization. Um, that that was the one of the points I was trying to get to in the previous thing. I kind of missed um, is that because it's made for working with like individual objects, it's really bad at vectorizing uh, operations. And there's also the problem with like mutable state because objects increase the amount of mutable state programs have. Um, Instead of just telling a computer a sequence of instructions that it needs to do to accomplish the task that needs to be accomplished, object-oriented programming and says that you have to create all of these different doer objects or these um, these managers of state that you have to manage while uh, in order to do these operations. So the, the state actually ends up persisting outside of the function that it needs to be in. So uh, it makes threading more difficult. Because your your information can be scattered all over the place, it's nuts. Um, so it makes threading diff more difficult. It makes vectorization more difficult. It messes up your cache. Um, it causes it causes loss of memory locality. And uh, as well, on top of this, like if you want to talk about memory management, um, going back to this topic a bit, in languages, um, well, I guess. I should be very specific in talking about C++, but I don't think that maybe some other languages like D might do it as well. Um, but I'm not too familiar with D. Uh, they try to do manual memory management through something that's called uh, REII, um, Resource Acquisition is Initialization. Um, and uh, the problem with REII isn't the initialization part, it's the destruction part. Uh, because the object is supposed to be destroyed at the end of the lexical scope, and when this happens, if you have, if the object has to allocate or free any memory that's inside of it, uh, anytime you do an assignment from one object to another and it copies that pointer, and one of those objects goes out of scope, it ends up destroying the memory, so you end up having uh, one of the objects is a, has a dangling pointer to memory that's already been freed, or if both objects get destroyed, you have a double freeing of memory, 
And so the only way that you can actually deal with this problem is that you have to create these things that are like a copy and move constructors, or you might have to use um, smart pointers, like you might have to use a weak pointer or a smart pointer that does reference counting. Well, first of all, reference counting is not uh, good, for perform uh, good for performance. Um, the people who say that don't know what they're talking about. Uh, they just assume that because it's just a single uh, instruction that is all it takes in order to increment or decrement that, that it's supposed to be fast. Um, but the, the particular problem with it is that it's an atomic operation that has to be performed for one. So you have so by doing this, you increase the number of atomic operations that have to happen. And for two, uh, when one object goes out of scope, because of the way that REII works, there can be a whole hierarchy of objects that have to be destroyed, which again causes a huge amount of problems. But uh, another big problem with this as well is exceptions, because ex when you start to Object-oriented programming tends to also make use of exceptions, and when an exception fires, you have to do a reversal of all of that state, so you have to destroy all of these other objects. And so now things become even more unclear. Um, it, it becomes a nightmare, like so much so that most of the people who were using C++ in a professional setting, um, not just like themselves plus one, two other people, um, not just... Um, some piece of software that nobody knows or cares about, but people who've been using it for long periods of time, who use it for like 12 plus years, and I'm talking about game developers or whatever, uh, when they use C++, they don't use things like the STL or Boost, um, or they might, they'll, they'll often avoid things like exceptions. Um, they might actually avoid REII in some cases. They'll turn off uh, runtime type information, all different kinds of stuff, all of these different features that they're disabling or avoiding, and it's because of the headaches and the problems that it causes. Um, now, I'm not saying that automatic memory management in general is a completely terrible idea, but I'm saying that when you're using automatic memory management with object-oriented programming, the only sane way to do it is with garbage collection. Uh, if, if you try to use REII or reference counting with object-oriented programming, it's, it's a nightmare. Don't do it. Um, if you're going to take the performance hit anyways, you might as well invest your time and energy into doing something like C Sharp or Java or D. I'm, I, I don't know. Um, I think D's got... No, yeah, D's, D's garbage collected rather than uh, the other. But now, like, if you're, if you're using garbage collection, now you have, like, this whole other process that's running alongside um, your program that's constantly scanning your program. So it's just wasting CPU cycles. So, like, by definition, like, your program can only get slower and harder to maintain and more complex by using object-oriented programming. Um, doesn't matter what problem it is you're trying to solve. If you name any problem under the sun, doesn't matter what it is, where it is, um, the object-oriented solution is always, and I mean always, I'm not saying this figuratively, I'm not saying this is a matter of opinion, I'm not saying this is some subjective thing, no, it is absolute fucking matter of fact, that whatever it is, the object-oriented solution is worse than the procedural solution. Now, um... When I talk about procedural programming, a lot of people will realize, oh no, we came from procedural pro programming, you know, like we know that's terrible, that's 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 dumb. Why why would you ever want to use procedural programming? Like we want to go back to the Stone Ages. Oh, you're gonna program in COBOL. Um, first of all, there's, I don't think there's any modern procedural programming language um, that incorporates features that have come from the past like 10 years. But the thing is that you can have a procedural programming language that has modules that has uh, pure functions if you wanted to have it like in certain cases, um, with properties um, or traits, uh, with mix-ins, with interfaces, or with generics. Um, there are tons of features that are implemented in object-oriented programming languages that are not specific to object-oriented programming languages. As a matter of fact, all of the best features of object-oriented programming languages aren't specific to object-oriented programming. The things that make them the most effective, that make them the most useful, are not object-oriented. And, and I, I really can't express that enough. There is absolutely nothing that object-oriented programming is good at. 
And, and if you want to ask, well, why is it so popular? Well, the thing is that it wasn't originally. Like, if you, there are videos of Bjorn Straustrup talking about C++ back in the day when he first made it. Um, he was trying to make a, he was trying to make a C with like a stronger type system, and he, he originally called it C with classes. Um, but the thing is that almost no one wanted to use it because, like, it, they, they couldn't actually gauge that there was any benefits that they got whatsoever to using it. Um, and if they did, it was so small. Most of the people that were using C with classes, they were really only using it because it had like a stronger type checking. That was the really real reason they used it. And he knew it was a failure. He says so in his video. And he said that he what he was going to do is that he wanted to kill it. But the thing is that he couldn't kill it because um, he would feel guilty because some of his colleagues were actually using it. And he didn't want to pull the rug out from under their feet. So what he decided was that he was going to just try and... Um, he was going to try and take a route where he could try to get the, the thing off his own hands. And so he was just adding everything under the sun to the language in order to gather people to it. And so in this process of just constantly piling on more and more crap into the language, um, ended up attracting a crowd. And so eventually you had like a C++ standards committee. And, uh, and so the language evolved. It was no longer C with classes. It was C++ plus all this crap. Um, <laughs> pun intended there. But... Um, so it wasn't the object-oriented aspects of C++ that made it popular. But the thing is, is that was the thing uh, about C++ that was most unique at the time because most uh, programming languages didn't have object-oriented programming in them. So people saw this one feature um, that was completely different in coding style that stood out from everything else, and they assumed that the reason why C++ um, was so popular and why it was... Um, why it was as useful as it was, was because of this one feature. And so everyone started duplicating this. You had like Java, um, C Sharp, like all these other different languages that were starting to incorporate these ideas. But the thing is, is like we've had 30, I think, I think it's 30 years now. Maybe, I mean, might be closer to 40, I think, for this game to play out, for that to deliver on the promises that it had promised us. And it hasn't done so. Um, programs are now like larger and more bloated and more destructive than they've ever been uh there was a uh, there was a bug in chrome i think it was it was it was derived from standard string in c++ where like every time you pressed a key press it made 25,000 memory allocations and you you someone who's looking like at this who's, who doesn't understand the problems with object oriented programming looks at this and they say how does that happen like, like, how do you... What, what the hell happened? Well, the answer is simple. Uh, the answer is that object-oriented programming creates so many levels of abstraction between the problem that you're trying to solve um, and what it is that you need to actually do that you can't see where the the where the code is actually going and what's actually going to happen like you can't really determine from your initial site what is that what the program is actually doing um, it makes programs harder to reason about um, this is just the nature of distributed programs in general like if the more components that there are the harder it is to reason about um, but anyway um, I just lost my train of thought there for a second So, so what should we be doing these days? Well, for one, we need we need to have new languages. Languages is that can look at the lessons that we've learned in hindsight and can uh, build off of the things that we know work and, and work well. But object-oriented programming in particular, like, if it was up to me, the word class should be banned. Like, fucking banned. I, I don't... Don't even provide the option for anyone to use that because if they... If you... If it's able to be used, it will be used... And the problem will never be solved. Um, but anyway, I know a lot of people are probably going to hate this. They're probably going to have flack on it because they all think that, oh, well, it works for me, you know. But well, like I said, you're wrong. I don't care. Um, dislike if you like. Uh, dislike. Flag. Don't subscribe. Thanks for watching.